Well, good morning, Grace Commons. And good morning to all of you who are worshiping with us online. We're so glad that you are with us today as we gather in the sanctuary or online to worship the living God. The psalmist writes, O come, let us sing to the Lord and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving and singing and joyful songs of praise. I invite you to stand if you are able, and let's sing together, sing praise to the Father.
and please be seated. We come to the time in our service where we bring before the Lord our confession. I will pray and leave room for you to have silent confession as well. Let's pray together. God, we say we want to know you intimately, but the way we live does not prioritize a deeper faith, a faith that trusts you completely, a faith that transforms how we live, a faith that puts you first. So we come to you today asking for forgiveness for our feeble attempt to live the Christian life on our terms and to walk with you only when convenient or easy. Lord, help us to seek to know you deeply because we are deeply known by you. May you be our first priority and not our last. May we pursue you with the same passion that you pursue us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our silent prayers of confession. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God has everlasting love, the psalmist tells us. And Isaiah says, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. I, I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sin. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. And now let's stand together as we say what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, before I read the scripture this morning, I have the great privilege of introducing our guest preacher today. Uh, his name is Ray Donatucci. He's a no stranger to most of you. Ray has been involved in this church since 1983. He's an ordained Presbyterian pastor and has worked for Young Life uh, for the last 48 years in a wide, probably every role there is except president. So it's a delight, it's been a delight for me to get to know Ray, and I know it'll be a delight for you to hear as he brings the word this morning. Our Old Testament reading, our, our scripture reading is from Psalm 40, verses 1 to 5 and 11 to 17. Hear the word of the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. 
He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth and a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, O Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. Good morning. What? Uh, give me just a second. I need to say hi to some people, if you would. Thank you for letting me do that. Um, could we leave that last slide up for a little bit? That one? But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Don't delay. Uh, today's sermon, let me get this started. I am going to do my very best to stay to 25 minutes. Today's sermon is on a new song. God gives us a new song. Have you ever played the game of, uh, oh, you're at a family gathering and you go, okay, what, what song represents your life today or in the last week? And you come up with a song. I'm sorry, I still have this on. Um, you come up with a, oh, how are we doing here? I don't know what happened, but there we go. Uh, you, so you come up with a song that represents your life. Or uh, it's kind of common within certain circles to talk about the soundtrack of my life, where you think of songs that represent key moments in your life. Um, when you're a kid, a teenager, certain songs obviously come to mind. When you're in college, other songs come to mind. In your young adult life, other ones come to mind. And they form sort of the thread or the theme of your life. Today, we want to talk about singing a new song. Let me start with the end in mind, okay? I hope we all know that when all is said and done, we will sing a marvelous song collected in a community of people where there's no more death, dying, sickness, injustice, pollution, anger, despair, depression, confusion, all the things in life that break God's original design will be dealt with and we will be able to sing something far, far more majestic, if you can believe this, than the Hallelujah Chorus, okay? So let's start with the end in mind that that's, but right now we, we sing a different song. 
uh, life's become difficult for a lot of people. And the song we sing may not be in a major key. It might not be the kind of song that gets you up out of bed in the morning and whistling a tune. It might be a lot heavier than that. It might be slower than that. The book of Psalms contains 150 Psalms that can be divided into three groups. The first group, everything's awesome. God, the maker of heaven and earth, is great. He's chosen us. He's given us a king. He's given us good things. Isn't this wonderful? The heavens declare the glory of God. Woo-hoo, okay? There's that group of songs. Then there's a second group of songs. songs. They essentially sort of say, there's something terribly wrong I'm at the end of my rope, but thank you, Lord, for coming to my rescue. Psalm 40 begins as if it's one of those songs. I was in deep despair. I was in a deep, miry pit, and I waited patiently for the Lord. I called out to him, and he found me, and he pulled me out. And now, isn't he wonderful? The sun is up. The sky is blue. It's beautiful. And so are you kind of thing. It's just great. And and that sort of equation, hear me now, and let me back up here for just a second. I'm going to really need you to work with me on this because you could be grabbing rotten tomatoes and tossing at me in a minute, okay? That is one of the voices in Scripture. I'm in trouble. I call out. God answers. All praise to God. Sometimes we pray and the sick are healed. The confusion is dissipated. The disappointment finds some kind of resolution and encouragement. We, we, we find what we're looking for and we go, thank you, Lord. But other times, life is not that kind. The sick do not get healed. The conflict we're in is not resolved. Our disappointments deepen. Our confusion sickens. And we cry out, where are you, God? Where are you? I have to admit, reluctantly, that uh, I can operate with this equation in mind. I'm going to try hard. I'm going to be a good, disciplined, faithful follower of Christ. I'm going to have my devotions regularly. I'm going to adhere to a moral compass and I'm mostly going to love my quirky neighbors, and I'll do all that in hopes of avoiding suffering. And that's where the third group of psalms come in. And I don't know if we can put Psalm 88 up there. I don't have the way to do that here, so if you can. This is my paraphrase of Psalm 88. Get the tomatoes ready. But read it in your Bible, if you will. O Lord, I believe you love me, but I've been on my knees to you night after night. I'm so troubled and in so much agony. My pleading is never far from my conscious thoughts. I feel like I have one foot in the grave. I'm in a deep and dark place. I'm absolutely without hope, including in you. I feel like you put me here. You really don't seem to care. I've served you, obeyed you, loved you, and yet I am flooded with terrors. Actually, let me be blunt. You've abandoned me. I'm alone, 
and this feels like it's your fault. Have you ever felt like that? The psalmist certainly has. Isn't it interesting that uh, if I said that in church, I can imagine the response. Um, you'd put me on the prayer list, first of all, and uh, you'd send me to a Bill Mayer recovery group. Um, and it's just hard imagining someone talking like that in church. The guy just doesn't know his Bible. He has weak faith. I was never told that faith sometimes looks like this as well. When the scaffolding of our faith crumbles, when the things we thought we knew that fit into the equation of I'm in trouble, I pray and God delivers, doesn't work. What then? What do we do? Some would say, and I've heard many of these, everything happens for a reason. You just have to find the reason. There's a reason for why this is going on. Is it lack of faith? Is it unconfessed sin? It's something. There's a reason for this. Or there's nothing broken that God cannot fix. Or what kind of father gives a stone to a son who's asking for bread? Or stop negatively confessing. Don't say the negative. Say the positive. Affirm the positive. And we get to a kind of toxic positivity where we talk about whatever the adversary is like an NBA player talks smack to his opposition. That's how you talk to, to cancer. That's how you talk to the problem. Or our God is a God of yes. He wants to give you what you're asking for. Or here's a series of verses. Keep repeating these verses. Now, before you get up and walk out on me, there are times that's the appropriate thing to do. There are times when, when that's the faithful thing to do is to remind ourselves of who God is. But what do we do when he's silent? There are mothers and fathers who beg God for their children's lives, and all they get is silence. What then? Well, the Jews had a name for this. Actually, it was a place. In their cosmology, Sheol was the place of the dead. When you died, you went to a place called Sheol. But often, the living would end up in Sheol as well. Sheol is the Hebrew, uh, the Greek, the Latin was Hades. And unfortunately, we translate that to hell in English. When the, when the Apostles' Creed says he descended into hell, the original word was Hades. He descended into Sheol. We'll pick that up later. Sheol was a deep, dark pit, total darkness, it was, it was a bog of mud. It was a swamp. It, it was a place of abandonment and alienation and chaos and despair. Does that sound like life sometimes? And so to a Jew, sometimes life would cause you to end up in Sheol. The psalmist in Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he reached down and drew me out of the pit, out of Sheol. He was in Sheol. You know what I don't like about that? I hate, I grew up in the faith saying that the 
The devil is in the adverbs. I waited patiently. That seems to me like a contradiction of terms. I, I don't think I've ever waited patiently for something. Or have I waited patiently enough? But this psalmist says, I was in deep, dark confusion. I was in darkness. I couldn't get out. I was stuck in the mud. It was chaotic. I was abandoned by God, but I was waiting patiently. I'm sorry. That wouldn't be me. I'd be trying to claw my way out to no avail. So to the, to the Jew, this was a place of desolation. When the emotional chips are down and God is nowhere to be found, you're in Sheol. Sheol reminds us how vulnerable and fragile we really are in this life. The word vulnerable actually comes from the Latin word to wound. When you're vulnerable, you're woundable in life. Life will wound you. And if it hasn't wounded you yet, thank your Lord. But it will wound you. Maria Popova wrote this. In every life, there comes a time when we are raised to the bone of our resilience by losses beyond our control. Lacerations of the heart that feel barely bearable, that leaves us bereft of solid ground. What then? What then? We talk of the goodness of God. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. But permit me to say that the circumstantial evidence for the goodness of God is inconclusive. For every sunrise on Long's Peak that takes your breath away, I'll raise you a wind-swept wildfire or a, a department within medicine called pediatric oncology. And so here we are as people of faith. On the one end, we believe God is good. We believe he's there. We believe he loves us. But on the other hand, we're highly woundable. Life is fragile. And really ugly things happen that are out of our control. And that's the world we walk into. And some of the faithful just want to say, this doesn't exist. The really faithful and committed cling to this. And I want to warn us that that's a kind of denial that our faith affords us that we might want to be careful of. That the ancients called this dilemma, this opposites, this paradox, and antimony. Two things that are true at the same time that have to be held together and that if you sever them, you sever them at the loss of truth, of some kinds of truth. And so they have to be held together. Think about that. Life as we live it is beautiful, is wonderful. The grandkids jump up on your lap. You see the sunrise. We walk in the mountains. We have dear friends. 
We have a church. Life is wonderful. And life is cruel, harsh, and hard. And here we are. What do we do? What's our response to that? We're left with a choice. One is to raise our fist in anger, disgust, turn our back on God. You know, this whole faith thing, I, you know, I was just, I was led wrong. If this is the good life, and I, I've said this in times of deep despair to God. No wonder you have so few friends. <laughs> Look how you're treating them. You know, and so you just raise your fist and say, I've had it. I, I, you know, I was just duping myself in this whole faith thing. Or the other is to let go, is to surrender. I've been raised in a culture that said that faith was a what. It was something you know and believe. Faith was a what. What I'm discovering in my own journey through pain and suffering is that faith is a who. It's not what I believe. It's in whom I trust. And so... How does a heart break? A heart breaks one of two ways. It breaks apart, it gets shattered into pieces, or it breaks open, becomes more tender, more expansive, more capacious, more grace-filled, breaks apart, becomes harder, becomes tougher. I become smaller. I become more protective. What's your response to suffering? I would say this, that trusting God does not extinguish sorrow. In the end, darkness and sorrow are not explained. They are defeated. Did you hear that? They're not explained. I can't explain why some houses burned and others didn't. I can't explain how one night I went to bed and when I woke up, my life changed forever. In a heartbeat it changed, or rather, in the lack of one. I can't explain that. But I trust this, that the love of God has the last word. The darkness is still dark, but it's not given the final word. What is my only comfort in life and in death? It's that I'm not my own. I belong in body and soul in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus. Can we put this slide, no, next slide up? This is Blake's sketch of the Trinity. We confess this in the Apostles' Creed. We said, he descended into Sheol. He descended into hell. Our creeds remind us Jesus came to join us. The psalmist in 139 declares, if I make my home in Sheol, you're there with me. You may not heal the sick. You may not reduce the conflict. You may not deal with the disappointment. You may not give me clarity but you're there with me. And what a beautiful picture of the Father embracing the Son in the midst of suffering. 
And that picture is God embracing you in the midst of the tension of these two seeming opposites. I'm tempted not to share this, but I, I will. I think I have time. Tell me I have time, Randy. Tell me I have time. Oh, good, I have time. This, this may not work so well in, in the next service, but um, I, I'm going to share a story. I, I hope it does not trivialize the topic that I'm on. But I'm pretty sure we've all had the family camping trip from hell. <laughs> you know the one where you borrow a friend's tent and you piece together enough sleeping bags for the family, you buy the hot dogs, the s'mores, the popcorn, you drive to a camping site. You're not gonna car camp, oh no. Even with the four-year-old, we're gonna hike in a little bit, pitch our tent over by the lake, and we get there, and it's a little bit of a forced march, but we get there, and now we realize we probably should have practiced putting the tent up before we got out here. <laughs> and as we're trying to figure out the tent, and one of the family members has built the fire, we hear a clap of thunder, and it starts to rain, and we frantically get the tent up, not very well, and the rain becomes a downpour, and we're soaking wet, and the fire gets put out, and we gather in the tent, and we think we're dry, and we make s'mores with unroasted marshmallows, <laughs> and we try to make the best of it until we realize that the runoff is coming down the mountain right through our tent, and our sleeping bags are now soaking wet, and reluctantly, we tear down the tent in the pouring rain, throw it in the backpacks, and make the trek back to the car through the mud in the rain, and we get in the car soaking wet, muddy, cold, dirty, miserable. We turn the heat on in the car. The five of us sleep in the car that night, stiff necks. Mom snores all night. We can't get to sleep. It is miserable the next morning at first light. We drive to the closest greasy spoon. We have breakfast. We use the restroom to get the mud off our hands and faces, comb our hair. We eat a breakfast that, in my family, we say, we rented that breakfast. We didn't buy it. It's just <laughs> full of grease. And we drive home miserably. We're just miserable. Flash forward 20 years, we're at Thanksgiving table. Our adult children are sitting around the table. We're talking about life growing up. And one of the kids goes, remember the time we went backpacking? Remember how miserable we were? And everybody laughs. Remember dad? Oh, I've never heard dad use those words before. <laughs> Oh, and mom snored all night. Mom, you're a snore. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You know, and, and we laugh about it. And, and it becomes a bonding moment for our family. Now, I, like I said in introducing this, I don't want to trivialize what I have been through, what you have been through. It's truly horrific. It's disgusting. It's egregious. It's not how life was meant to be. But could there be a time in a way that just as that camping trip from hell was somehow redeemed in some superficial way, that in a much deeper and more substantial way, the pain and suffering that we've endured, that we are enduring, that one day might have a different twist to it. Some people say, Ray, you're foolish to believe that. You're just
being naive. I want to bet that's true. I want to bet that's where the goodness of God will show up. For now, our song is in a minor key. For now, we cling to God with some hope and faith and some doubt and discouragement. But we choose to cling. The uh, word amen at the end of a prayer is basically a declaration of trust. It's as if we're saying, we're done talking now, Lord. We've said our piece. We've put the matter in your hands. Now we trust you with it. I'd like to close in prayer from a passage from Habakkuk. Even if the fig tree does not blossom and there is no fruit on the vines, if the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, even if the flock disappears from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will praise God. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Amen. Amen. continue our worship now in a time of prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to start by simply adoring you. 
thanking you, giving you praise. We have heard indeed a new song today. We have heard your truth from the Psalms and the Psalmist and from your servant Ray. And Lord, we know it's true because it's your word. But we also know because your servant has come out of his own pain, out of his deep walk with you through Sheol. And Lord, we pray that each of us who have heard these words today would hear them as your love expressed to us, that you will indeed remember us, walk with us, and touch us. And Lord, we, we thank you for ourselves, but we thank you that this truth is available to every human being who ever lived. It's available to those who have suffered so much in the last month those who have lost homes and cherished possessions and loved ones, those who have struggled with illness, those who have buried their loved ones. Lord, this truth is divine truth. It's holy and we stand on holy ground. So Lord, we bring to you now in a moment of silence those on our hearts who need this word from you today. And Father, we thank you today for the work of your spirit through this congregation, as, to, as in a moment we will gather our elders and deacons and trustees who have been elected over the past two years. We will pray your blessing upon them. Lord, lead us through these leaders that you have called. Thank you for their service. We give them into your hands. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
And you may be seated. We are now going to do what hasn't been done for a couple of years because of COVID. We are going to be ordaining elders and deacons and installing trustees uh, this morning. So let me invite, uh, if your name is in the bulletin under officer ordination, please come forward and sit in the front row. But if you're uh, an elder currently serving on session or a reserve elder, I invite you to come forward at this time and sit in the second row because later in this service you will be uh, joining me in laying hands on our brothers and sisters newly elected. <clears throat> elder Greg Parr has, is going to introduce our service of ordination and then we'll continue. morning. I want to welcome you to our service of ordination and installation this morning. Um, over the past couple of years, as you well know, our congregation has faced many challenges. Um, to name just a few, the worldwide panic, pandemic, and panic, um, the, <laughs> the departure of um, three beloved pastors, um, internal conflicts, and most recently, and and maybe the most close to most of us, the catastrophic fires. Um, many in our congregation have been affected directly, staff, um, covenant partners, and those who weren't affected directly, probably as you as I have felt um, affected emotionally, uh, especially realizing that if that spark had moved a mile in a different direction, uh, could have easily could have easily affected me directly. So, um, but the good news is, during this challenging season, we found um, cope and comfort from the Holy Spirit. We've come together for worship, sometimes together, sometimes not, for the ministry of the Word, for sacraments, and for fellowship and service in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So today we gather and worship again. Um, as we um, gather our elected elders, trustees, and deacons, and the, as we ordain the, the elders and deacons um, that were installed, that were elected last November. But in addition, because of our inability to meet, we are also going to um, ordain those elders and deacons from 2020, some of whom we have already spent a lot of time working with enjoyably. So um, that's what we're going to do this morning, and we ask you to join us in that. Well, let me invite uh, those elders and deacons, only if you have never been ordained, please stand. And I have some questions for you. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you boldly declare Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church? Do you? Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the word of God and inspired by the Holy Spirit, the unique witness to Jesus Christ and the authority for Christian faith and life? Do you? And will you receive, adopt, and be bound by the essential tenets of ECO as a reliable exposition of what Scripture teaches us to do and to believe? And will you be guided by them in your life and ministry? Do you? Relying on the Holy Spirit, do you humbly submit to God's call on your life, committing yourself to God's mission, and fulfilling your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ, under the authority of Scripture and guided by our confessions. Do you? Will you be governed by ECO's polity and discipline? And will you be accountable to your fellow elders, deacons, and pastors as you lead? Will you? Do you promise to be faithful in maintaining the truth of the gospel and the peace, unity, and purity of the church? 
And will you pray for and seek the service, seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, will you? And for the elders, will you be a faithful elder watching over the people in their worship, nurture, and service to God, will you? And for the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon serving the people, urging concern, and directing the people's help to those in need, will you? And those trustees who have been elected, please stand. Will you be a faithful trustee, fulfilling your responsibilities as a trustee of the corporate affairs of this congregation, will you? And now Greg has a question for the congregation. So for Covenant Partners and congregation, I have questions. Do we, the Covenant Partners of this congregation, accept Jonathan Anderson, Tim Childs, Jenny Fox, Greg Rankamp, Mike Scott, Shirley Berg, Spencer Duzabut, and Dean Stahl as elders, and Linda Carlson, Jim Rodosky, Mary White, Debbie Tucker, and Douglas Walter as deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ according to the word of God and the constitution of ECO. If so, please say, I do. And do we agree to pray for them, encourage them, respect their decisions, to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? If so, please say, I do. And now um, I invite all, uh, all elders uh, and deacons, whether you now to be installed in this time of prayer, if you haven't already stood, please stand. And I invite those elders and reserve elders who have gathered in the front to lay hands on all of you. And let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the priesthood of all believers. We thank you that this truth was recovered in the Reformation and that as we gather today to pray, ordain, and install these officers, we acknowledge that you have given them gifts, a heart to serve you, and that that has been recognized and we have indeed elected them. But Lord, far more important than that, you have chosen them. You have filled them with your spirit. And now we pray, Lord, that they would seek to honor and follow your leading as they lead your congregation gathered here, online, and in, the, in our homes. Father, we pray for each one of them that you would give them wisdom beyond their years, that you would give them the guidance of your Holy Spirit, all the gifts of the Spirit, that they might indeed serve us with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. And now as we lay hands upon them, we give them into your hands, trusting in your Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You are now elders, deacons, and trustees chosen by God to serve in this congregation. So whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You, are this, you are able to go back to your seats, and let's continue in our worship. Our charge and benediction. Pastor Ray, we're, we're, uh, we're so glad that you brought the word to us this morning. Here's the charge. When we reach that point where things simply make no sense, when our thinking about God and life no longer line up, 
when all our thoughts that we knew about God and how the world works are ripped out from us, when any sense of certainty is gone, and when we can find no reason to trust God, but we still do. That's what trust looks like at its brightest when all else is dark. May God meet you in your life, in this day, and all that is in front of you. May you know his presence, and if you don't know his presence, may you find the courage to trust it's there. May you learn how to sing a new song, even if it's in a minor key. May God bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.